everyone. Um, so we're at time now. So I think we should um, start with the webinar. So um, my name is Kate Morgan. and I'm head of policy and access here at Myeloma Patients Europe. Before handing over to our moderator for the session, I just wanted to briefly welcome everyone to this mm -hmm. MP webinar mm -hmm. on access mm -hmm. to clinical trials um, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, the webinar um, should last for around 90 minutes. Um, next slide, please. And during the event, we'll hear from um, our colleague Anne Pierre about the findings and recommendations from an MP report analyzing access to clinical trials in the region. And you can see from the agenda too that we have invited stakeholders to present their country specific perspectives on access to clinical trials. So we have Professor Roman Hayek from the Czech Republic, Professor Oliver Karanfilski from North Macedonia and Barbara Leonardi from Poland. And we're really happy um, that we have such great speakers um, and a range of attendees to discuss this important topic today. Next slide, please. So um, again, I just wanted to go through um, some of the housekeeping for today's session. So you'll all have noticed, but this session is being recorded. Um, so if you wish to stay anonymous, please um, switch off your cameras and change your name on your screen. Throughout the event, we kindly um, ask you to mute your microphones so we don't have any disturbances. And um, we will have a Q&A session um, after all of the speakers have finished. Um, and as we're expecting quite a few people to join today, um, please write your questions in the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen. And we'll collate those and the moderator will ask them um, at the end of the session um, during the, the panel. And if you're facing any technical difficulties, um, please use the raise hand function again, which is at the bottom of the screen, and one of my colleagues will, will um, come and help you. So today marks the culmination of um, a lot of work from MPE, our partners and our members in Central and Eastern Europe, and we'd like to say a big thank you to everyone um, who's been involved and who's helped us with this, and particularly members of the Central and Eastern European work group on access um, that's, that's um, part of MPE. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to our moderator for today, um, Biba Dodova. Biba is founder of the North Macedonian um, cancer patient organization, Borka, um, and she's also a board member for MPE and has been instrumental in leading the work that we do on access in Central and Eastern Europe. I um, mean, she's just generally a superstar. So we'll hand over to her now. Thanks, Biba. Thank you, Kate. So hello, everyone. I'm Biba, and I'm so happy to welcome you today. This webinar is a result of a program of work initiated and designed by MPE Central in Eastern Europe work group on access, which I co-founded with my dear colleague Kristina Modic from Slovenia. The work group was initiated to promote collaboration between MP members in C countries as their access issues specific to the region we need to address as a community. So today we have members from nine C countries and the initial advocacy issue we identified as a group was variation in access to clinical trials. So as a result of this, we commissioned a project designed to understand the barriers and opportunities for conducting and accessing clinical trials in CE. Today, we see the launch of this work. I'm very happy to this, with this and alongside advocacy recommendation for discussion. So we know this is a very complex topic. So no one size fits all for quick solutions. Uh, however, uh, through the report, we want to start discussion and ideas for the future. To kickstart the discussion, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, Anne-Pierre Picard. Anne-Pierre works for MPE as Access Secretariat, as, uh, and uh, she is an independent consultant. She brings to the table over 20 years of experience working on access and advocacy issues, and she has helped MP with the coordination, analysis, and write-up of the clinical trials research, so which she will present today. A quick reminder to mute uh, your microphone and post your questions and comments in the chat. Over to you, Anne-Pierre. Well, thank you, Biba, for, for the introduction. 
Um, um, that's great. So I'll get started. Next slide, um, please. Yeah. So um, Biba already mentioned the um, you know the objective of of this um, of this research in um, that there was this um, knowledge of the lack of access to trials and inequalities in access to ongoing trials. So really, MPE with its members wanted to 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 look into it and decided to conduct this business research. So I'll just remind again the objective to to inform the infrastructure needed to run a clinical to run clinical trials, but also to identify the barriers to those clinical trials. And based on the knowledge um, collected um, through these two objectives, to develop recommendations for patient advocates to call for um, policy um, initiatives and action to address those gaps. So this piece of research is focused on the myeloma and AL um, amyloidosis community, but certainly some of the recommendations also serve other patient advocacy communities. Next slide, please. So this, this slide is sort of a snapshot. I, I don't want to um, dwell too much on my methodology, but I still want you to, to, to show how we came up with those recommendations. So it was a three-step approach, um, which first run analytics of the myeloma trials that were run um, between 2001 and 2020 worldwide. Then we conducted a literature review on barriers and facilitators to clinical trials. And with the data collected in those first two steps, uh, we, we, in we interacted with stakeholders in three Central Eastern Europe countries um, to, to get their feedback on the information um, collected. Could you, yeah, next slide, please. So this is a, a fairly busy slide, and I will not go into detail, but to show you the process through which um, the um, um, Concilium Scientific company we we, um, we worked with on this and supported us in, in that particular step. This is the process that they went through. So identifying 3,229 myeloma trials, which run which ran between 2001 and 2020, and just going through the process of so identifying them, cleaning the data, analyzing the data and reporting it. You will see there's one key takeaway. Obviously, the report will provide more details, but one key takeaway really um, for this particular slide is that of those 3,229 um, um, clinical trials, only 201 trials recruited, um, well, um, sorry, for, well, yeah, recruited um, patients from Central Eastern Europe. So only 201 um took place in central eastern europe that's six percent of the totality of trials and for the purpose of this study the we considered you know we adopted a, a wider a definition of central eastern europe than the one from the world bank and central and the oecd so it, it covers actually 24 countries we can you can see on this slide so this is a, a very large definition of, of of the region next slide so this table is is really um really really interesting in this 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 piece of the research that we got from the analytics. You could see a chart with with all those twenty four countries listed and how they feature in terms of the number of trials run in terms of the number of identified myeloma research centers. And you can see that the top so the top three countries in terms of the number that which were included in myeloma trials are Czech Republic, Poland, and, and the Russian Federation. So with 128, 95, and 79 trials. Next slide. Well, that's in absolute term, because if you look in relative term, look at how Hungary is doing really well also. 66 trials, that's fewer trials than the Russian Federation. But considering, you know, in relative terms um, to the population, which is much smaller, they're doing really well. So this is really just telling us that some countries, um, you know, we should really look into be best practices in countries that do really well in relative terms. Like Czech Republic is doing extremely well in relative terms as well. Next slide. Another interesting piece is just like who's running, who are running trials, and the picture is, you know, it's different um, um, to Western Europe in that the uh, proportion of trials being sponsored by industry is larger. Next trial, and uh, sorry, next slide, not next trial. So now I'm going to touch briefly on the methodology for the literature review. Um, this is. Um, quite detailed, but I just wanted to sort of point of entry. We we're a bit naive initially. We thought there was more in the literature review than actually there is on clinical barriers to clinical trials in Europe and, and Central Eastern Europe. So we, we 
focus on the disease, the myeloma, on the region, Central Eastern Europe or Europe, and then on clinical trials. We got zero papers in PubMed, Scopus or Lens. So it forced us to actually expand our research. So we actually looked worldwide. And when we look worldwide, then we get a lot of papers from the US. But this is what it is. This is what the people, what the, this is what the literature says. So, um, then we also had to expand from myeloma to oncology, but also looking at, at immunoproliferative disorders, hematological disease and rare disease to make sure we would get, you know, relevant papers to barriers and facilitators to clinical trials in disease areas that would be sort of have similar challenges than myeloma. And then we focused on um, on a five year um, um, period. Next slide. So um, on the previous slide, there was a table with a search script. So, you know, the, the sequence of, of the keywords and the combination of which. So with those three search scripts on those three databases, um, we identified in the end 24 articles. Uh, next. And so the, the data, the information in those 24 articles, which I identified, we actually wanted to structure it according um, to pre um, to published um, um, literature, to publish um, method methodology, excuse me. And we chose that of Zimbida, which um, um, you know published a narrative approach to barriers and facilitators to trial. So there's different sort of questions to ask oneself. So does the trial exist? Um, is it accessible? Is the patient eligible? Is it presented to the patient? And you know, does the patient accept, accept so all these different steps and where things could just go wrong? And you see on the right-hand side, and next to this chart, um, that for example, five papers out of twenty-four, you know, um, you know, touch and, and touch on that particular topic of the patient eligibility. So this, you know, um, these topics are being structured that way. Next. And then just sort of really making sure that, you know, we have the right process, the right way of presenting the data. We also cross check against another narrative approach, that of another um, researcher, Unger, who identified four barrier domains. So structural, clinical, physician and patient, which actually correspond very much so to um, Zimbida narrative approach. So with that sort of um, solid framework, we use that to really um, present both um, the key takeaways, but also the recommendations. And I'll go into more details in further slides, but I'll just talk in the next slide about how we conducted the literature, um, the stakeholder interview. Next, please. So as mentioned, um, after the analytics, the literature review, we wanted to talk to stakeholders in the region. In an ideal world, we would have liked to talk to um, um, a large number, but you know, we uh, we eventually spoke to um, eleven stakeholders from three different countries, um, and just to make it really relevant, we chose specifically um, stakeholders from a um, leading country, so Poland, so with a high um, um, clinical trial availability. Then we wanted to go for a country with a medium uh, clinical trial availability, so we we, we chose Croatia. And then for a country with a low and clinical triviability, Macedonia. Um, so we spoke to an um, initial country hematologist, patient organization representative, also a health authority representative, and a clinical trial organization representative. Next. So this slide is um, is a bit busy, and but it shows the four barrier domains that um, I mentioned previously. I'm not going to go into details in each of the sub bullet points because I'll just present the recommendations which are structured in the same way. But I want you to focus on the bottom part of the slide where you say right below structural, you see reasons for more than three out of four US cancer patients because the publications are mostly about the US. But you know, the reasons why more than three out of four cancer patients do not participate in, in trials are structural. This is where the, the biggest challenges, the biggest barriers lie. Then at the other end, on the patient, um, on the patient end, um, you know, when eligible patients are offered a trial, they actually accept they say yes 50% of the, of, the, of the time. So you see in terms of how the, this sort of weighs in is reflected in the number of recommendations that we drafted. So we drafted 27 um, um, recommendations in total, 
17 relate to the structural barriers, which is where we found the problems, the, the most problematic. And two relate to patients. And then for clinical barriers, we've got five recommendations. And for physicians, we've got three. Next. But before um, we present those recommendations to you, we know, and as Biba rightly um, highlighted, and, and also um, um, Kate, we would like to have a word of caution because uh, we completely um, understand that all recommendations may, may be applicable in all countries um, due to a varying level of resources, uh, which will make it very difficult to implement, might not be applicable, might not be relevant to all. But really, the purpose here is to get the conversation started, list issues that were really, you know, really pointed out in the literature review and by stakeholders. And we look forward to your feedback and questions in the chat. Next. So, um, as I mentioned, 27 recommendations, 17 are about structural barriers. They're very, um, you'll see in the report you have, when you have time to read, and they're very well detailed, but I'll focus on some keywords which are listed on the right hand side for, for time's sake. Um, so, recommendation one and two are really about um, cross border research networks. So, to establish some, join, or work with existing ones. And the benefit of cross -border, um, border research networks is really to have a more sizable myeloma patient population for trial sponsors. So, really to have different countries joining together to offer a sizable um, um, and patient population. Also, that would help facilitate trial preparation and implementation. And that would also help raise the international profile of um, um, CEE researchers. Uh, recommendation three is really, I mean, stating the obvious, but, you know, there's a need for more investment in R&D, but just for stakeholders to really encourage and um, sort, of, sort of pressure upon um, policymakers and, and decision makers to invest more in R&D. The fourth recommendation is really to um, to go to learn from best practice best practices from from various European countries in wh where some national uh, rare disease or cancer plans were in place, which really helped uh, create a momentum and and promote clinical trials. Next, please. Um, also, um, in our recommendations, um, we we call for medical societies to play a role in defining minimum staffing and infrastructure requirements. That's uh, recommendation five. But also in recommendation seven is to set up clinical trial training. So really just to help define and train and define the re on the infrastructure and, and train um, researchers and metologists. Also, um, um, we felt that um, participation or being an observer to the European Clinical Infrastructure Network would be a benefit to see countries. Um, also, we, we feel that um, there's a need and a really an urgent need for policymakers in the region, but also in outside of the region, but within Europe to address the, uh, the brain drain, the healthcare professional brain drain, because a lot of researchers move from Eastern and or Central Europe to Western Europe, and this is really detrimental to, uh, to research in the region. We also felt that the um, COVID-19 had an impact on, on the clinical, conducting a clinical trial, and it would be of interest to understand how that impacted it, and but also how to further um, address similar situations in the future. Next. So um, something of importance that was highlighted is the EU membership and, and the regulations that come with it. Um, but um, there's um, a regulation that was in that it's in being implemented, start, its implementation starting in 2022. And we'd like to encourage stakeholders to monitor its implementation, but also encourage non-EU members to look into this rec to this in this regulation and try to um, advocate for and encourage uh, that their own processes align as much as possible with the EU regulation so that it would it would streamline the process for them and to be for those countries to be included in international trials. Um, we we'll also um, recommend and encourage EU stakeholders to look at best practices in those countries that do really well in relative term 
in regulatory processes, but also in terms of their international um, um, R&D reputation. So the Czech Republic, Bulgaria and Hungary, especially. Also, um, um, we'll um, recommend that stakeholders in, in the region promote the creation of contract templates to shorten the contract regulation negotiation time. Next. And to conclude, so on the structural barriers, so we also feel that, um, you know, journals and medical societies also could support and promote the participation of CEE researchers by giving them dedicated funding to attend conferences, but also to be able to publish in the journals. Also, we, you know, we recommend sponsors um, to, um, to arrange as much as possible for routine tests to be conducted in local hospitals versus the, um, the uh, experimental center. So that way patients don't drop out in the process of the trial, that it makes the, the burden, the administrative burden, the travel burden less, and so that patient would, would just stay on the trial the longest possible. Also, you know, we uh, recommend industry to provide travel and accommodation allowances to patients and their carers. And um, also um, we recommend that there be um, an agreement in the research community on a short list of data management programs because there's a multiplicity of those and smaller hospitals cannot afford to uh, purchase them all. So that's uh, one piece as well. Next. Um, also, so this is clinical trial barriers. So we'd like, um, we, we, we really recommend sponsors and encourage sponsors to use broader inclusion criteria. More often than not, the inclusion criteria are very stringent and it's very hard for patients to be included. It's very hard to actually find those patients. We also uh, recommend injury sponsors to support um, access to clinical trial to see patients by accommodating for different local standards of care. Um, you know, it's just, it so happens that if those standard of care um, in the trial are just not nowhere to be found in the region, then patients cannot access it. Also, I recommend policymakers to establish um, or, or join existing cross-border research networks, as, as mentioned earlier. Next. And so the, the, um, the last two recommendations for, on clinical barriers is um, for to call for more homogeneity in the treatment guidelines and the clinical practice, because what a patient will get in prior lines will definitely impact you know, how and if he can, she, or if they can actually enter a clinical trial. So this is really key that patients have the same ch chance at entering a trial by having an homogeneous um, um, clinical practice. We also encourage, you know, stakeholders to, um, to look into fair pricing models um, to access standard of cares in clinical trials, um, which is a big challenge. Next one, please. So now we're touching on the physician barriers. Um, and we identified three of those. Um, you know, it, it so happens, and this is published in literature review, but also being discussed um, by patients, is that not all physicians will actually discuss clinical trials with their patients. Not all hematologists do. And it requires uh, knowledge. So we really encourage all stakeholders and healthcare professionals included to actually use the EU clinical trial register and promote the use and share that information with their patients. Um, we we'll also um, recommend that national and international medical societies set up training on how to communicate clinical trial information to patients, because it could be at a particular point, the hematologist will actually talk about a trial, but is not trained in communicating in a more user-friendly way and patient not understanding what it has stake and how the trial protocol is and so forth may not feel in a position that they can accept the trial. Also, we'd like um, sponsors to involve patient representatives to not only to review the informed consent form, but also to inform the clinical trial design, which is really important. Next slide, please. And I'll um, conclude on the two patient barriers that we identified is that, um, and two recommendations, sorry, two recommendations that we've identified to help address um, pain barriers is that for patient organizations to, to um, dedicate some 
to um, time and resources to providing user friendly information on trials. So, as you know, clinicaltrial.gov exists for physicians, but just providing a, a more user friendly type of information to relay that in their in their in their own country. And also, um, we, as mentioned, information we collected in the literature is very much US focused. So really, we know, understand, and acknowledge that further research in country-specific barriers to trials in Central Eastern Europe are really needed. So this, this piece of research is influenced by what has been published, but we really want to actually go beyond and look at specifics in the region. Next. And with this, I'd like to, um, you know, to thank, um, um, to provide some sort of limitations to the work. There's always, you know, as much as there's been such a huge team effort, and um, as mentioned by Bibi and Kate, and thank you to everyone. But, um, you know, we uh, we had really solid trial analytics. We can't do the literature review, but as mentioned, a lot of it uh, in the literature is US centric. And we only um, interviewed 11 stakeholders, so from three countries, and we probably and certainly missed some specifics from other countries. So this is a, you know, a kickstart of a conversation, and we want to go beyond and, and go further, and we welcome um, your contribution and input. And, um, and also, we'd like to mention the recommendations here do not represent the opinion of the people that were interviewed. We give special sense, thanks to um, Concilium Scientific, without which the analytics would have not been so um, so fabulous. Also, Pat Vukets um, and um, the Professor Dominic Dittfeld, uh, Dr. Kinder, Professor Karen Filski, uh, Barbara Leonardi, Mira Armour, Mirja Babamova, Mirjana Babamova, Eva Oldak, Maria Trajewski, Vesnik Hamiti, Lukasz Wisch and uh, Joko um, Todorewski. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, NPF, for your helpful insight and recommendation on access to clinical trials. So uh, you can find the shared link in the chat uh, with this recommendation. And uh, well, for me, it was a very interesting to see how each country compares in terms of clinical trial access. So North Macedonia, my home country, has a small number of clinical trials in myeloma. So the situation across the Balkan is very similar, particularly in non-EU countries with no synchronization with EU legislative. So I'm interested to hear the perspective of the panel during the webinar on why this is and how it can be improved. So. Um, well, um, our next speaker is Professor Roman Hayek. Uh, Roman is a professor of oncology and head of the Department of Hemato-Oncology in the University Hospital Ostrava. Uh, Roman is ex extensively involved in clinical research and trials in the Czech Republic. He is the head of the blood cancer research group in the University of Ostrava. And it's a chairman and a founding member of the Chess Myeloma Group. So we are uh, looking forward to hearing him speak about this research. The floor is yours, Professor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Biba, for a uh, uh, nice introduction. Hello to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, actually, you know, congratulations. Uh, for such uh, excellent al analysis focusing on this clinical trials issue and challenges in our region. It's really, really important. So it's actually one of my favorite topic, uh, in fact, because uh, I actually established first uh, clinical trial units exactly 20 years ago. At that time, I was in Brno. Um, and after moving uh, uh, to Ostrava 12 years ago, there was nothing, no clinical trials in Ostrava. So we established uh, general clinical trial units. Uh, and after 10 years now, we are where we are. So that would be just brief summary and some comments uh, because, yeah, it's a really important topic. So next slide, please. So that's an example about our department uh, of uh, hematology in Ostrava, focus on active trials. And uh, you can see that uh, 
We are currently running more than 80 trails in this year, this year and uh, one quarter of them uh, uh, has active enrollment. Of course, I'm myeloma guy, it's my favorite topic. So more than one third of uh, uh, trials uh, are focused on some uh, monoclonal uh, gamma party, smoldering myeloma, uh, newly relapsed myeloma, or even uh, plasma cell leukemia or amyloidosis. So I just add information about uh, new type of uh, trials focusing on new immunotherapy tools like CAR-T or BI or three specific uh, antibodies. In fact, uh, we just opened another one. So we have now active six, six trials. And on the bottom, you can see uh, the distribution uh, um, between the type of trials, phase one, two, and three. And we're trying now already third year to change our strategy, be more focused on uh, more difficult, uh, but very interesting phase one trial, and especially even phase one, first of human use trial, which required even some special, special certificate from regulator authorities. Uh, and then you can see the proportion about academic and sponsor trial. Actually, uh, this is uh, not correct because it's proportional about patients in academic and sponsor trial and uh, uh, there are probably 9% of academic trial currently uh, in our department. So that's how it's organized and what uh, we achieved uh, and what is available for our patients, which is, of course, important for them. Next. And this is an uh, example, again, focusing on what... Uh, uh, what we need really from infrastructure to run the clinical trials. So we have a study team, uh, total of nine data manager research nurse uh, sitting in three rooms. We have one another extra room for CRO staff uh, monitoring the clinical trials. And uh, okay, so what you need is educational room as a part of outpatient clinic. Uh, the same is for large to store, not as the only part of uh, outpatient clinic, but you need more large stores, definitely. It's really nice uh, for data managers and research nurses if the centrifuge, refriger uh, refrigerator and freezer are specifically reserved only for clinical trials and ex exactly placed in outpatient clinic. It's very convenient for them. And then we have biobank and flow, cyto facility, flow cytometry facility. And both of them serve now as like central lab for check clinical trials, IIT trials or trials uh, under umbrella of Europe myeloma network. And of course, uh, if you're running the uh, clinical trial space one, you need special room, uh, special equipment, and especially the place is important close to intensive unit care. So that's the conditions, uh, what you need uh, from infrastructures and uh, uh, team. Next, please. And, you know, it was nicely reviewed, uh, executive summary and 27 recommendation with previous speakers. So I have just few comments uh, uh, from, you know, my perspective uh, and based on my experience, definitely establish or join cross-border research networks that definitely could help. And uh, I definitely encourage uh, anyone who want to visit our center to learn how we organize the clinical trials, certainly welcome. Then uh, it was mentioned the uh, European Clinical Research Infrastructure Network, ECRIN. Uh, and, uh, you know, to me, it's uh, from our countries, it's only in Czech Republic. Uh, Czech Republic is member. Uh, they are, uh, this clinic is in Brno, but they have no impact uh, actually to our activity. Uh, the reason is because it's not only for cancer trials, but it's for all type of trials of all type of diagnosis first, and they have of course limited capacity. And then they are focused on IIT trials, academic trials. And if you have some, then they can, they can probably help significantly. And of course, uh, critical for a good start, it was several 
uh, time repeated is really minimum staffing requirement, job description, hospital infrastructure, as I try shown uh, before. Next slide, please. And from other comment, uh, definitely important is training and peer-to-peer -peer support programs on clinical trials. Uh, to me, COVID era uh, actually now have no impact. Uh, probably at the beginning uh, had some limited impact, but that's, I think it's not needed to explore it even. Definitely uh, to review best practice, uh, good positive example from countries like Czech Republic that could help identify some issue and challenges. And to me, um, it's uh, usually not needed even to be focused on local hospitals. Uh, to me, the most important is to be focused on large main, usually university hospitals in region. Region should be uh, size as uh, starting uh, with half million of habitants. One million plus is definitely better. And local hospital, and university or this main hospital that should be very flexible net network. That's, that's, that's then working. And it's exactly what we are actually doing with regional hospitals and regional hematologists inside the Czech Republic. It's nicely working. Uh, next. And then uh, of course the, uh, you know, clinical trials are important uh, for university hospitals and uh, management of hospital usually don't care significantly, but they should recognize how important it is for, for hospital. And I just briefly summarize, it's important from patient's perspective and benefit, because there are so many unmet needs, uh, clinical situation. And of course, uh, if you have some option in clinical trials that really can significantly help uh, to our patients. Then there are some academic benefits. Uh, you know, we are, you know, exciting if you can use uh, uh, new drug, uh, novel immunotherapy, bispecific, trispecific tri tri antibodies. Then uh, we have to be seen, you know, so, so be part of the publications. That's, that's important. And uh, usually typically in academic clinical trials, but also in some pharma uh, trials, there are some type of collaborative research. So again, we can be involved in research. From This is important from academic uh, point of view. And of course, for the management of hospital is important money, usually. So the first, I always emphasize, emphasize that the drug is for free. At least the experimental drug is for free. And usually replacing quite expensive drug, which uh, which cannot be used if the patients uh, is enrolled to clinical trials. And this really um, is significant. And then of course, uh, running the clinical trials inside the hospital, especially pharma trials, it's, you know, it's uh, significant income for hospital. I just uh, use this model for illustration from all money coming from, from clinical trials, we first fix expense for data management team. Then we have something for physicians uh, and bonuses. Then we have some operating expenses for all related things uh, to clinical trials running in a hospital. And then still significant profit for hospital. Just in Hauhen, for example, it's close to 3 million euros per year. So it's significant. And next, finally, I just try to emphasize minimum starting set for clinical trials. You definitely need at least two data managers. One is not enough because uh, you always need some backup. One room for data manager, extra fridge or freezer and freezer, education room, one store room, and definitely three, four dedicated doctors who are willing to run clinical trials and participate. And of course, the most important Starting point is to sit with management directors, uh, deputy directors, and make some agreement that these conditions are mandatory and otherwise you can run the clinical trials. So I think it's uh, my final slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah, and next, please. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for attention. Happy to answer any questions.
Uh, thank you, Professor Roman, for your presentation. So your work in Czech Republic is very impressive. Uh, comparatively high, high number of trials in the country highlights the ability to attract research in myeloma and uh, the important role that doctors and researchers have in collaboration and promoting a good research environment. And uh, actually, there is a lot we can learn from the success of the Czech Republic, and we look forward to discussing this further during the panel. So, uh, our next, yes, and uh, well, our next speaker is Professor Oliver Karamfilski from University Clinic for Hematology from Skopje, North Macedonia. He is a professor of international medicine and head of the induction chemotherapy and the intensive care unit at the university clinic. As a leading expert from the Balkans on hematology, he is a past president of the board of the National Macedonian Hematology Association and a founding member of the Balkans Myeloma Group. So given his experience, we will provide an overview of his research experience in North Macedonia and what currently is happening in our country. So, uh, well, Professor uh, Karamfilski, the floor is yours. Thank you, Biva. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I'm very glad to be among the speakers here, especially because I have the least good things to say about clinical research. I was uh, very pleased that uh, Professor Hayek just uh, touched the issues that we are still facing and probably that what they have overcome is a good result from joining the EU. These differences between EU countries can be seen. I mean, founding members of the EU and the new members do have differences and they were well, well visible in the table as well that Anne Pierret uh, showed at the beginning. But this is an idea, a vision to unify our practices and possibilities to uh, in, get involved in clinical research. I'm speaking from a country that has some uh, geographical attributes that are not very easily understandable. I mean, we are belonging to a Southeast European region, members of the Western Balkans and have North as an attribute for the country. So this is all over the world, the country as, as I see it. We can go to the one of the two slides that I have prepared. They're text slides. So what are my opinions, my views on why we don't have clinical trials at all or enough to play any kind of a role in uh, managing to, to establish a common, uh, common surrounding, common environment, and common conclusions about this and other diseases as well. The first obstacle, as I see it, is the low recognition of the people working in hematology and myeloma in the region, because uh, we are mainly doing clinical research, which is not the kind of research that the good papers would publish. Uh, very large studies, yes, they would publish, but in a country that uh, you had a data that we are over 2,100,000 and the census of 2022 uh, uh, revealed results that we have decreased in size by about 10%. So uh, 1.8 million is the current status of population of North Macedonia. So there is only one hematology adult center and one pediatric hematology center. So this is not a problem. This is centralized by force of, of nature. But uh, doing clinical research, meaning uh, seeing outcomes and risk factors and the treatment options and the results is the only thing we can do since uh, financing in uh, laboratory research is very scarce. If you don't have uh, clinical trials or results that would be worthy of a good uh, medical journal, then you, you have slim publishing, publishing options as well, as it is also limited by the amount of money that would be needed to publish in a, in a, in a good journal. 
this is something that equals about six monthly salaries of a, of a starting physician in, in, in our country. So with all of this said, uh, it is not really possible to establish this uh, expert status that will be visible to other colleagues around, uh, outside the country. And this is a vicious cycle. If somebody doesn't see you, then you don't become a member of a clinical trial. If you're not a member of a clinical trial, you become less visible and so on. It is very difficult in my country to try to treat patients by expert guidelines. There are two guidelines that we mostly respect, uh, US and uh, European. So we need to adapt. This is in a, a word that I chose to adapt to local circumstances, which means adapt to what medication we have and what procedure and what procedures we can we can uh, impose for the patients. Patients, uh, if we don't have some medication, it would be okay, but not to have maybe a second or a third line of treatment in several diseases would certainly limit the possibilities. As Professor Hayek said, the regular stuff you need to have, the experimental drug will be given on account of the, on the clinical trial, yes. That also includes some sophisticated diagnostic options. So we do have, let's say, flow cytometry, we do have PET scans, but when it comes to some sophisticated diagnostic options, we, I'm sorry to say, but we don't really have them. This also applies to investigational procedures. We have gone in the world of myeloma to diagnosing uh, and monitoring patients with next generation flow cytometry, next generation uh, genetics, and uh, some of this we have, but are not available to us. And what Professor Hayek uh, uh, accented is that we don't have an existing statistics department, which would be specializing in biomedical statistics. We do have a department of statistics, but this is general. And people over there do know the basis of statistics and details of statistics, but it is not too much defined towards biomedical statistics, survival, PFS, and stuff like that. Data management is performed mostly by medical doctors who would become a part of the, of the clinical trial. So this is not a specialized profile uh, among us. There might be problematic selection of patients where we would uh, probably include our possible bias. And this is what resulted in, uh, fa in patients failing uh, to, to survive the, the clinical trials that we were included as little as they were in, in the, in the uh, report of UNPR. Uh, not having the monitoring from the inside and certainly not having a centralized monitoring would problematize our data reporting because some people would feel that they're not as accurate as they should be that we include bias in reporting the outcomes or the level of success we have had with the treatment. And when we defined endpoints and outcomes, we might be slightly adapting to our terminology. This is why monitoring needs to be centralized and it needs to be from outside because in a small country where everybody knows everyone, it's, it, it might have some flaws. Uh, selection of trial participants is a big question because if you don't have the so-called expert as a recognizable person, then uh, somebody that is running the trial should know, should have a criteria how to choose the people that the, the trial is going to function with in our microenvironment. So this is a problematic thing, uh, having in mind that you cannot actually seek for the portfolio for the portfolio of the expert you are you are looking for to include in the clinical trial. Politics does have an influence in the profession and in the clinical trials because uh, managers of institutions and medical institutions are appointed by the political establishment, and this is often not a person who has the uh, expert status. 
not only in one disease, but in the, in the field as it is now. So this is what we have to deal with. And uh, obviously with trying to enter the union, we are probably going to have some solutions that are going to overcome these issues. We can go to the next slide, Biba. And over there, I state what I think could be uh, maybe uh, improvements in this sense. Uh, we do have quite a lot of discontent by knowing that we know the, the, uh, the ways how to treat the patients, but not having either the medication or the procedures to affect this. And if we're not following guidelines, uh, we cannot use all of the guidelines available, which means at least one of them is assigning to a clinical trial. <laughs> Participating in clinical trials could enhance local visibility and expertise, and also our patients could, uh, could benefit from this. Possibilities for including patients in clinical trials could provide them the innovative medication, which we now lack. They do uh, standardize the treatment and diagnostic options for most of the patients or all of the patients. So there are not going to be variations by individuals uh, entered in the trial, which is what also Professor Hayek uh, just mentioned. Uh, data analysis would be improved because if we manage to have a separate uh, database or data management uh, segment, then comparisons and scientifically supported conclusions would be unified and centralized. Diagnostic possibilities could be upgraded, enhanced, improved, and international interventional procedures as well. And we would have closer, more dedicated care for the patients and the improvement of our performance status would uh, be uh, implemented on the whole department, the whole profession. Uh, what we need to provide as a starting point is enlarging of the territory and the patient number. And this is what we're doing in trying to open ties between all the uh, former uh, Yugoslav countries, and especially in the profession, which we have done even before politically connecting with the other countries, is we're trying to establish a community, a network of regional uh, centers, hematology centers, is what we have already done in the myeloma uh, Balkan group which is led by Professor Yelena Bila from Belgrade and uh, who has also acknowledged the need to have a really recognized expert in, in this group, which is why she succeeded in uh, managing and to include Professor Meletio Dimopoulos in this group, which is a very valuable acquisition. And we hope then in the future, we could present a wider array of patients entering and having the possibility to enter clinical trials. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Karanfilski, thank you so much. As a patient advocate for North Macedonia, the key, message of, uh, the key messages of your presentation really resonate. Uh, so you as an expert in uh, North Macedonia and uh, uh, has a very important role as not only only as a medical expert that recognized and support the patients in their needs and work together for overcoming the challenges that are not only in Macedonia, but also visible in all other countries. So synchronizing the legislation of EU, implementation of uh, that data and biomedical statistic, of course, uh, and uh, Balkan uh, myeloma group, uh, I believe that 
will help to overcome the barriers and opportunities for conducting and accessing clinical trials in CE. But as you said in your uh, presentation, we need to uh, constant uh, political uh, uh, establishment. So I hope that this idea and work on Balkan myeloma group will be result to have a progress in order not only to access the clinical trials, but as well as the new therapies that could prolong patient lives and will be recognized by the policymakers in our countries. Well, uh, I will move forward. So um, uh, our fourth and final speaker is Barbara Leonardi. Barbara is a patient advocate and she is a member of CARITA, the Polish multiple myeloma patient organization. She also recently joined the board of NPE. So Barbara, who was diagnosed uh, with myeloma in uh, 2019, is extensively involved in activities as national, at national, but also European level, promoting access to treatment and clinical trials. She will present and her perspective as a patient advocate and, uh, and experience of the situation in Poland and the Central and Eastern European countries. So Barbara, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, Biba. And a big thank you to MPE for facilitating and publishing this research. I really think it's uh, extremely important. Um, I will say a few words about a patient's experience, and of course it will be uh, focused on Poland and based on um, my personal experience and conversations with other patients. However, I think uh, a lot of these points are quite universal and uh, can also apply to uh, other countries. So let me start with uh, a simple question. Why do we need uh, access to clinical trials? I think we can see three main reasons. Um, one uh, very basic, very obvious that was already uh, discussed uh, are therapeutic reasons. So clinical trials provide access to modern treatment and uh, address unmet needs. And as you all know, and as uh, both professors said, um, there are still gaps between uh, the Western Europe and uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And there is still a lot uh, to be done in our countries uh, to, to close these gaps and clinical trials uh, part a big role here. Another big group of reasons is uh, education and awareness uh, about the disease. And I mean it uh, in a very broad sense because one aspect is uh, that clinical trials provide um, education for uh, medical staff, for uh, clinicians and for nurses, and also can provide some professional opportunities and make the um, hematology prof uh, profession more attractive. But I think it also uh, can raise awareness about the disease, about the diagnostic process, about the symptoms, because the more we speak uh, about it, uh, the more information will go to the media and will reach the public. And this is what we need because uh, myeloma is still, uh, it's a rare condition and it's still is not, uh, not many people are familiar with it. Not many people are able to uh, notice the symptoms, especially that, uh, as we know, they are not very specific. And what is very important for patients is the psychological impact. Uh, and for patients, this is something extremely, extremely important and makes a big difference during their therapy. One aspect is uh, to give hope, because as we know, a myeloma uh, path uh, hopefully can be very long. Uh, and will mean, which means also, you know, many treatments on the way. So when we know that there is something there along the line, uh, it, it gives hope everyone and can, can help during their, during their myeloma path. And also uh, when we know that there is some clinical trial, we know that uh, we don't need to accept whatever is offered in our country we can always try and get maybe something uh, 
better, maybe something more suitable for a patient because every patient is different. Every patient needs maybe a slightly different approach. And let me uh, conclude this slide with a case study. So a female patient over 40, overall in good health, uh, started her treatment in 2020. With, there were two options. The standard Polish uh, treatment, which is VTD plus uh, the transplant and no maintenance, uh, versus KRD, uh, so treatment with carfilzomib that lasts 24 months, uh, only chemo and no transplant. Uh, after the first part, maintenance. So two questions. Which treatment is better from the medical point of view? I dare to say no one knows the answer. Uh, and the second question, which one can suit the patient better? And this is the, the question that only a patient can answer. Uh, but what we know for sure is that the standard treatment uh, is heavy and creates a big burden on the life of the patient because the transplant procedure Although, you know, it's well studied and uh, it's, it has been done for many years, it's still very difficult for a patient and requires a long uh, recovery period. While 24 months of uh, carfilzomib may sound like a very long uh, treatment, but uh, is well tolerated and doesn't affect uh, a patient, patient's life very much. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. So yes, what are the um, barriers from the patient perspective? Again, I see three groups and I think also they were, uh, they were all uh, laid out and included in the report. One uh, is um, access to information or lack of information. First of all, uh, as I know from discussions with patients, the internet remains the main source of information. It should be doctors, it should be our clinicians. Unfortunately, it's still not the case. And as we know, uh, myeloma is a disease of elderly people. Uh, so by default, they are excluded because not all of them uh, use the internet. They are not so familiar with the digital world world and how to find information. Um, another point is the quality of trial materials. One case is how they are prepared, so they don't necessarily take patient into account. The, the materials are prepared in such a way that they require certain um, medical knowledge or knowledge of the medical language. Uh, they are long, uh, they, they are different difficult to digest to under, and to understand. And on top of this, so basically they are written with a different goal in mind. They are for clinicians. Uh, and on top of that, we also have uh, the problem with translation because it doesn't help if a difficult document uh, reads as if it was translated by Google. So certainly there is something to be improved here. Organizational issues or structural issues. This is something we already discussed. Uh, one is uh, where the clinical centers are uh, located and they are in big cities uh, because usually the trials are run by uh, university hospitals. Um, so it creates a problem for patients to, um, to access them because A, um, we have a cost problem, a cost of uh, travel, a cost of accommodation, because if a patient has to be in the hospital at seven o'clock in the morning, very often they cannot travel on the same day. They need to travel a day before. Um, oftentimes these patients have to come with someone else because they are unable to drive or maybe they are not in a shape to travel on their own. So we have additional burden on, uh, on the carers. And the final, uh, the final uh, group of uh, barriers or problems uh, is the perception of clinical trials. 
uh, we still, uh, it's still quite common uh, that, that clinical trials are seen as uh, medical experiments and that patients are guinea pigs. Um, this is something that can be changed, um, probably, you know, can be addressed by some campaigns. Uh, also, patients are afraid to commit to something that they are not familiar with. So if they don't understand the materials, the documentation, oftentimes they don't understand they can withdraw at any time if they don't feel comfortable uh, or if they don't um, feel well with the medication. Uh, another point is that the process seems difficult and complicated. Uh, so again, perception. Next slide, please. What can we do to overcome access barriers? I think definitely um, this is something that has to be done, has to be um, tackled by all stakeholders together because uh, patient advocates uh, alone cannot change that. Uh, we can support uh, pharma, we can support clinicians, we can provide data to policymakers, uh, but we cannot do it uh, on our own. So what can be done is definitely uh, to address the information gap uh, and change the image of clinical trials. We should distribute the information more widely. We should think of some uh, inf uh, campaigns that can explain to people what clinical trials are in general, plus what they do in myeloma. Because many patients are also afraid that they will just receive a placebo. So we, th there are points we could, we could ask patients about their fears and then tackle them one by one. So it's really good to see that there are such initiatives like the uh, MPE's white paper, because this can really change, uh, change something. So we really hope uh, that it will be translated into Polish uh, because this is the chance to you know, make it uh, widely available and start a discussion, um, start, start a discussion on the, on the wider, wider level. And what is also great is to see that, you know, in Poland, we have a, a Polish network for clinical trials. Uh, this is a unit that was uh, established within our medical research agency. And uh, there is also a unit dedicated to patients uh, where patients can go and ask questions, get information, etc. Of course, we are at the beginning of the road. Uh, but it's great to see there are initiatives. What also has to be done is taking into account patients' perspective. And this is something that um, both um, pharma stakeholders and clinicians should keep in mind. Um, and we, this is an open, open question. We can think about how to address uh, patients' issues. If they can get some support with their uh, problems of reaching the, these big hospitals, um, maybe there is an option to, to review the clinical trial protocols to find ways how to make them easier for patients. Um, so first, we need to really understand our target audience and uh, understand what people uh, are afraid about, uh, what their challenges are, and then we can we can tackle that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Barbara, for your presentation and giving the important patient advocate perspective. So it is very important to hear the patient perspective on this topic, such as access of clinical trials. And uh, it shows why clinical trials are so important, how access issues impact on patients, and why effective communication on clinical trials is uh, of ultimate importance and uh, of course the role of the patient advocates are to inform and inform and to empower the patients to be to take a proactive uh, role in the decision making for uh, clinical access but first they need to be uh, uh, familiar with the clinical access so uh, well this concludes the presentation for today and now we are uh, move into QA uh, panel session. We have been monitoring the questions 
as we go along. So thank you all for all your questions. You can still send it in your chat and we'll take them in order. And our first, first question from the audi uh, audience, yes, I think from Ananda Plate was, uh, what is the panel's option on whether challenges in running tri uh, uh, clinical trials are country specific or myeloma specific? Do you think the challenges you found in some of these countries also exist in other cancers or disease area? areas or they're specific to myeloma? Uh, some of the presenters could answer. Vyoitsa? Okay, what would I try? Yes, yes, Professor, please. <clears throat> in, in my view, the main difference uh, exists between countries that are members of the EU and countries that are still not members of the EU. I would rather uh, hear Professor Hayek's opinion on this because uh, entering or accessing to the European Union also requires that you unify the legislature. This also means health legislature, legislature. And I think that once you have a standard option for working in this field, you are also enabled to be included in clinical trials. So I believe that Professor Hayek does have different views about the situation before and after entering the European Union. As far as the disease, I don't think there are uh, any essential differences in, in trials uh, regarding myeloma or other diseases. It's a design of the trial that is usually different, but the aims are also always the same. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, to the point, Professor Karamfilski. So our next question is uh, uh, regarding looking at the success of the uh, of the Czech Republic when it comes to availability of trials in myeloma and uh, how they are. Uh, and I wonder how much of a driving factor is uh, it is to have an influential clinical clinician like Roman Hayek, who is uh, internationally recognized and who is invest time and efforts in attracting trials to his home country. And uh, how much this really depends on the other factors such as infrastructures, commercial interest, etc. I think that we already mentioned that in your presentation, Professor Kar Karamfilski uh, uh, or, or uh, Professor Roman, you can also explain uh, the differences in the importance of uh, these factors. Yeah. Okay, so I can agree that it's always advantage if somebody from the country is internationally recognized. That's definitely benefit. But uh, not it's not just about that, you know. It's really important for, especially pharma companies, have three, four key centers with very good quality and ability to run the clinical trials. So they really... Uh, can realize that it's uh, pay in the end and they they want to open the country. So the, the first step is to decision to open the country. And this is uh, usually based on history experience uh, and cooperation with the uh, four or five centers from the countries. It's make some, you know, like some, some critical, critical number of uh, potential of the country and it's really really very important so 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 that's for me starting point to have agreement inside the country two three key hospital uh, you know make some announcement they are ready to they establish some uh, basic facility for clinical trials and conditions uh, make announcement and probably at that point we can we can we can help because the pharma companies very frequently ask who won't be another partner in these clinical trials and even for some specific clinical trials they probably require now to be anti cd38 navy which probably is mission possible to have patients anti cd38 um, naive, so so 
in Czech Republic and west western part of Europe, but it's possible in uh, in 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 country which uh, usually these drugs are not yet reimbursed. So so we can even help with some recommendation and redirection, but that first we need to see that this is some critical two three key hospitals guarantee quality uh, of the trials uh, in country. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Roman. Uh, the next question from our audience is uh, uh, diagnostic and their importance in trial. We uh, were discussed a lot today in the presentation of the doctors, but what ideas do you have on improving access to diagnostic? You know, it's always important topic, but I think it's uh, not related too much to clinical trials. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, it's a very important to have access. Sure, you know? sure, yeah. sure. Yes, we cannot uh, put aside this uh, this topic because we were uh, we were witnessing the, the, the uh, um, time frame between countries and the importance of diagnostic prior at the beginning of the of the uh, disease set uh, after uh, it's in the late st um, stadium. So, uh, well, the next question uh, uh, maybe. Just, Biba, yeah. yes. I, would, I, would, yes. I would like to add to this. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, in, the, in the layout, in the design of the study, you need to have some kind of a facility or some, or some kind of method for diagnosis. If you don't have it, you cannot become a member of the trial. So this is also so this why is, that, it is why important. Was, yes, yes, Professor. That's why I thought that it, it is a very important. But uh, maybe, maybe you you could uh, ask, uh, what do you have? Uh, wh what do you think? There's the best ideas. Do uh, myeloma uh, Balkan group has some uh, ideas how to improve this access because okay. it's related to the clinical trials. Uh, some investigations are possible to do uh, across the border, but this is not what we are striving to do. I mean, uh, knowing that there are methods with which you could improve the diagnosis and with that, the prognosis of your patients are something that uh, a country and institutions should strive to have for their own patients. So this is something that is a, a normal evolution of the health system. So I think uh, improving and enhancing the diagnostic possibilities do bring you closer to a clinical trial. This is why it is important to, to have improvement of diagnostic and therapeutic options as a precondition for being included in clinical trials. Yes, yes. So the next question uh, is uh, uh, regarding what you were saying about the legislative as uh, bureaucracy issues, but, but uh, we would like to hear, for example, uh, Professor Hayek, what is your experience with the bu bureaucratic issues? So uh, ethical approvals in setting clinical trials up because you show uh, very good results in the Czech Republic. So yeah. how do you think we, that uh, we, uh, how do you think that this should be uh, evolved in, in the future or overcome, how to overcome these barriers? I think the bureaucracy can't be overcome <laughs> because it's <laughs> elsewhere, you know, and uh, even, you know, I know very well the, you know, the administration procedures in key university hospitals. So yeah. sometimes in some period of time, uh, in one hospital, it's, uh, it takes like uh, four months, it's okay. In, in another hospital, it's eight months. And in another hospital, it's mission impossible to go through. But after five years, the management of hospital change and si situation is opposite in, in, in hospitals. So yeah. it's really fluid <laughs> field <laughs> and bureaucracy is elsewhere. And only what I always doing, uh, you know, as because clinical trials are for me important, I always keep pressure on the management of hospital. You know, asking the lawyers if it's everything is clear, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's need be proactive. That, that's my recommendation. 
otherwise bureaucracy is elsewhere. Well, well, yes. So Professor Karamtulski mentioned vicious circle in which the gap between the countries where trials are running and those where they're not running becomes bigger and bigger. And uh, uh, well, and Pierre, do you have any thoughts around what will be the first step of uh, uh, how to overcome that vicious circle? And uh, is there any way patient organizations and patients advocates could be supporting researchers in this country to improve the situation. I mean, this documentation and this work of C countries uh, uh, within the MP program uh, result to this all recommendation, but have you any thoughts about this? Well, I wish I had the solution, you know, just to say, hey, you know, let's start this and that, because it definitely varies you know, from a country to another, but the, you know, the list of recommendations is the reason why we have, you know, we were trying to be thorough is to provide a, a list of options to sort of choose from, done that would, some would be more easily uh, manageable than others. So it's hard to say, but as pointed out by Professor Hayek, certainly, um, the um, patient organization could advocate to European and global medical societies to provide support in terms of training, you know, for, for yeah. researchers. Certainly also provide support in the sense of, you know, help see researchers attend conferences, have, you know, allow, give more grants. Also medical journals support see researchers so that it's, you know, it's not the, it's very expensive to publish, you know, regardless of where you allocate. I mean, in a lot of US and, you know, Western European researchers say it's very expensive, but relative to, you know, GDP in Central Eastern Europe, it's even more expensive. So I think as patient organizations, just advocating to, it's a start, it's, it's not the key, but really empowering researchers to access that knowledge to access that training, being more visible, that would be already a tremendous start. Then obviously the funding, you know, it's a problem if the government of a particular country does not want to invest in R&D, it's challenging. But if European medical societies would help them just to, you know, to, to um, benefit from expertise from other countries like Czech Republic, for example, mm -hmm. and yeah. that would just give, that would incentivize policymakers and decision makers to invest more because they say, you know what, we have researchers that are published, they're trained, let's invest. So it could be an entry point. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, NPR. We have one question uh, uh, from the pharma. So one of the issues that sponsors may have is the questions of whether it is ethical to run a clinical trial in a country where after the trial, there is a very low chance that the medicine will be available for routine use. Uh, uh, so uh, is there is no realistic chance of getting local reimbursement? Uh, so it is ethical to do the trial. So what is the panel's view on this dilemma? How do you, uh, how do these results compare to the results of the MP Atlas? I, I do believe that it's still very ethical because never is a clinical trial a unicenter thing. It's a multi-center thing. And then you actually use the results if of course they are positive and you use them to do the pressure that Professor Hayek and everybody is talking about on the government, on the authorities, and say, we have conducted this uh, clinical trial. We have proven that we have a better option of treating and saving patient lives with this new regimen. And therefore, we press you to approve these drugs or this regimen or this uh, combination for further treatment of our patients. So without that, you don't have any means. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree, Absolutely. if I may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. And, and it's a chicken and egg thing. Because yeah. if we say, we anticipate it's not going to happen, it will never happen. I mean, then because yeah. the payers in any country will say, I want data about, I want patients, my patients to be in that data set. If those patients are never included, it will never happen. So I think this is, 
this is ethical because it's just we, we need to get we need to break that vicious, vicious circle that that Professor Karafisky mentioned. And if we don't include patients from from central, more patients from those countries, then that just means that we're giving up on them. And that's just from a patient advocacy perspective, that's unacceptable. That's my patient advocate hat. But yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Uh, Yorika, could you please uh, send your questions in the chat? We have. Uh, well, uh, we have I, I would. I would not. I have. I don't have a question. I have a comment, and I would rather talk instead of sending my my uh, written question. Okay. First thank of all, you. I would. First of all, I would like to thank all the speakers for their extremely illuminating presentations. I'm quite content with everything in me, in, in the sense that. It responded all my queries. I would like, however, to refer to something which Anne, uh, Anne Pickers uh, stated uh, when talking about barriers. Uh, in my opinion, one of uh, the very important barriers, which has not been covered, unfortunately, relates to the pharma lack of interest. Uh, I'm saying that uh, particularly after seeing the, the chart where pharma, um, according to the chart presented by Anne, uh, pharma covers 90% uh, or organized 90% of the clinical trials. However, 80, yeah. my country, how much? 80, 80 or 79% that was from the yeah, published trial. It's still, it's still quite a lot. It's still quite a lot. However, having in mind the very low number of clinical trials organized in Romania, and I will stick to Romania only, uh, it seems that out of this 85, 90%, you know, pharma has not been too much interested in organizing clinical trials in certain parts of Eastern Europe. And this is a fact. And unless we confront this openly, we will never be able to we will never be able to address the issue because we are living in a, in a time where policy and finance controls our life. And because we are speaking of finance when we talk about clinical trials, it is very important for pharma to take some interest in organizing this kind of clinical trials in our parts uh, mm -hmm. of Europe, particularly that MPE wishes to launch a white paper uh, for addressing the barriers. Unless you stipulate this barrier, I'm afraid that you will end to almost anything but to present, to preserve the present statu quo. So uh, in my opinion, you know, to conclude, uh, it should be mentioned in this white paper, the very low interest of pharma in organizing clinical trials in countries such as Romania. And I'm quite sure that the reason is not necessarily related to the fact that a lot of, a lot of doctors migrating, migrated to other parts of Europe. Yes. I do not know no. what yeah. exactly well, prevented them no, from of course. That. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Yorika. Yeah. Uh, for your for, for your comment, it is it true? So we are uh, we are having a uh, time only for one uh, final question. So so as you said, uh, as you mentioned, so the last question uh, will be from recommendation and solution discussed today. Which ones do you think would make the biggest difference to clinical trials in CEA countries if implemented? Now, from my point of view, you know, always choose one, two, three key centers in the country, uh, working together, establish conditions for clinical trials. And then the second, uh, we can, you know, educate anybody from any countries, highly welcome. And your part is probably to advocacy, to talk with pharma business, pharma companies, saying, okay, here, are the centers in this distinct country and probably you should consider these centers uh, to be active in clinical in your clinical trials something like this you know yes well 
Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have reached the end of the session. We are so pleased with the uh, rich discussion had today on access and trials, clinical trials in CE, and we're really hopeful uh, uh, this will facilitate meaningful work and this, uh, discussions on improving access for patients and uh, reducing inequalities. So as a next step, I would strongly encourage you you to download the report and recommendations uh, Kate already sent you, but and uh, let us know any additional thoughts and perspective on the topic by emailing access at mpeurope.org or address the topic for further. We are planning a multi-stakeholder discussion event next year on the topic of access to clinical trials and medicine access to medicine in CE countries. So please register your interest in MP work in this area. And uh, the mail is also uh, the same, uh, access at mpeurope.org. So, well, thank you very much all, uh, for, all the, uh, for all the speakers for your uh, insightful uh, presentation and uh, recommendation and uh, um, have a wonderful uh, afternoon, everyone. Okay, thanks uh, Thank to everybody. Much. Cool. Excellent Thank workshop. You. Thank you. Oh. Thank, Thank you, everyone, as well. Thanks. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye.